Hello, everyone, and welcome into the Bogey Bro Banter Boom. I'm Hunter, joined by Connor today. No, Trevor. Silas is working the retail store. It's just us. We're just. What We're are we going to talk about? I actually, I um, well, first I want to talk about what just happened to me out there. I was looking at the U section, uh, which I know this isn't a disc golf podcast, but it is what it is. It's looking at our <laughs> U section in our, our retail store mm-hmm. up front, like we always do. Mm-hmm. You know, new discs come in all the time. Yep, and Can't we constantly, help it. we constantly, us disc golfers have to constantly look through it. Yep. And I'm going through, and I recognize one of the discs, and I'm like, oh, this stamp. Like I played this tournament. And then I looked and it, I always wrote uh, Colossians 323 on the bottom of my discs. Every, like, that was just my individual marking. I'm like, this is my disc. And then I realized <laughs> it's the Thunderbird that made me fall in love with Thunderbirds. I got it in like 2015, 2016. It was one of the first Thunderbirds I ever got. Mm-hmm. And it's just, it's been in and out of my bag pretty much any time a Thunderbird's been in and out of my bag. Mm-hmm. And it just got turned, like, I lost it. I, I don't know the time frame of when I lost it. It's been probably a year. It's been a long time. Mm-hmm. It's been a long time since I lost it. Uh, Cause I remember being how upset I was when I lost it, but I, don't I remember, where I I was remember at. you losing it, but I don't know where or when it was. I yeah. think it, was, it had to have been at least a year ago. But um, it's something like if you love something enough, you let it go, and if it loves yeah. you, it'll come back to you. Yeah, the disc came back to it me. It came back. Uh, <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah, and and at first I was like, my phone number is definitely on this disc, and if you look at it, you can make out the number, but. In the person's defense, there's a lot of questionable digits in there. So they, they yeah. could have tried calling it and it went to someone else. Mm-hmm. I don't care. I would have paid $30 to get that disc back. I um, mean, that's that's so funny. I saw whenever he brought in the stack, I saw a guy walking in with a box and I was like, well, I got to go look at those. And I was just flipping through them really quick, just looking at the edges. And I saw that stamp and I was like, oh, that looks really familiar. And just like kept on going well, what and didn't think anything like, of it. I saw it and then I saw the my like my writing on it. And then my initial thought was, I have a bunch of discs in the U section yeah. anyways. I turned mm-hmm. a bunch in. I was like, why would I turn this in? And I was like, I didn't turn this in. And then it like slowly hit me that someone just turned my disc He literally back brought in. it in five minutes before you walked in. That's amazing. It's so funny. I'm happy that no, like someone, someone could have walked in behind me, bought that disc, walked out, and mm-hmm. I would have never known. Yep. I would have just, the Thunderbird would have came through our he door. He also said he was going to go to play it again to take all that, that big I would have never stuff, seen it. But he saw the foundation flags and brought it here instead. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. I would have never... I would have never seen it if it went to play it again. And so, you know what? He got ninety four dollars in trade in money for those discs. Yep. Worth every penny. I played again. He probably would have got like thirty. <laughs> Worth every penny. Uh, yeah. So I, I'm reunited with my old Thundy. Um, very excited about that. Very, Tech very Thundy. excited. Uh, and yeah, that I is, can't throw it right now Hunter. because I'm all gyro. But that's, that alone makes me know the Thunderbird's going back in my mm-hmm. bag. So. Uh, Hunter, I'm exhausted. We did a lot. I feel like we did so much today, and it's only one thirty. Well, the funny part is, um, the funny part <laughs> is, is That's if, you man. De- if you describe <laughs> what we did today, yeah, I know. It's not like, man, I've had a long day of work. It's <laughs> well, what did you do today, Connor? Uh, well, you know, I got there at seven. Um, we we talked about where this missing cube was for like 20, 30 minutes. Uh, then we went out to, to the disc golf course and we filmed we played disc golf. We played disc golf for a video and filmed that. And then we came back at, at around like eleven or so, and then we um then we we did a, a build an airplane battle with uh with. <laughs> and then I went to Dollar Tree. I went to Dollar Tree to get and I I built I built a paper paper airplane. Oh my gosh! Yeah, you're right. <laughs> I mean, I agree. We've done a lot. Like it feels like we've had like I feel exhausted because I just had a, I just got off the phone with a meeting at twelve thirty. Our like six month you know recap meeting. Mm-hmm. Um. And so I had that and then immediately we were like, we got to film the banter. I still got to film like part of the Sky God review because like Sky God's already dropped and sold out and the review never went up, but I wanted to go up before people get their hands on them. I got to do this David Wiggins promo thing and all this stuff. So like, but like when you just like talk about what you did, yeah. oh, you, you wait, you have all that to do and you, you you (laughs) built a plane. Sick. Good use of time, dude. Oh gosh. Um. Anyway, so for this top for this banter, it's gonna be obviously a shorter one because it's just it's just Connor. And I, I love being on this side and seeing what you're googling. Yeah, I googled <laughs> random topic generator and conversation starters, uh, and then I'm just gonna let it randomly generate a topic and conversation. Yeah. Paul. So Connor. <laughs> so Connor. Uh, are there any uh any songs that always bring a tear to your eye, man? Or yeah. What are they? We got to hear. Fifteen by Taylor Swift. 15. Oh, if you're 15, yeah. somebody tells you, yeah, that's gonna believe them. Yeah, you wanna know why? I, I mean, that's here we what the go. Let's get, let's get deep. Uh, it's because whenever it, we weren't 15, but I started dating my wife whenever I was 16 mm-hmm. and she was 15. High school sweethearts, how sweet. Um, same as Liz and I. Yeah. Well, we were, 
No, yeah, she had just turned 16. I was still 15. Boom. Me and Hunter are the same person. Um, and uh, whenever we were seniors in high school, I broke up with her because it was just a we were it was kind of a toxic relationship for both of us at that point. We both were just immature. And so I felt like we weren't good for each other. And it was very difficult because I had to break up with somebody that I still loved. And um whenever I broke up with her, that song came on like a couple weeks later when I was in the car. And I just liked Taylor Swift. And um and I was listening to the lyrics and I was like, oh my God, I did that to somebody <laughs> because I felt like I'd convinced somebody that I'd love them that I was never gonna leave them and then I'd I turned my back on them and I left them. It made, made, taught, brought, at the time, every time I heard it, it brought a tear to my eye. But you know what? It worked out. A year later, we got back together and here we are married. There you go. Mm-hmm. Boom. I guess I have to answer the question too. I was trying to think through my answer. There's one song that like, it doesn't always bring a tear to my eye, but it like reminds me of a very specific time. Okay. So it's like um, a lot of nostalgia. Yeah. And there's another song. I don't oh, remember. I know which one you're talking about. You want the one in in China? Yeah, which I'll I'll tell that mm-hmm. story, and then the other one, um, I'm trying. I don't remember. I don't remember it, so I'll just stick with one because there's there's another song that's like a very, like make you think song. Like mm-hmm. like it it just sounds like a fun song, and then you think yeah. about the lyrics, and it like makes you sit there and you're like staring at a wall. <laughs> I don't remember the name of that. It's a country song, the one I'm thinking of. Oh, he stopped it. loving her today. No. <laughs> Oh, live like you're dying. I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, oh, it's ga- the gambler. He stopped loving her today. I haven't sung heard that. by sung by George Strait, written by Bobby Braddock, one of the best country songs of all time. Mm. Uh, oh, very sad. Tennessee whiskey. That's what <laughs> Tennessee whiskey. The combination with Justin Timberlake. <laughs> you can't drink me away. No, uh, I don't actually remember the song. All right, tell us. But the, tell the, the actual, person, the actual one. one. <laughs> this doesn't bring a tear to my eye, but um, it like always reminds me. So when I was in eighth grade. My brother and sister went to China every year to teach at this English camp. Mm-hmm. And my brother was actually going to go over there full time. Uh, he was going to move to China, open a coffee shop over there, all this stuff. Uh, health problems stopped him from going. But he went 10 or 15 times to China. Mm-hmm. Then my brother and sister would go every summer to this English camp. He taught English for like two or three weeks at this school. Um, and so you would plan for months leading up to it. You're, it was like this, this summer camp. And the big thing was Americans came over and taught, taught English. And so I got to go one summer and I was my sister's assistant teacher. Mm-hmm. So my sister had all the lessons plans, all of that. I had to know the lesson plans, but I was like eighth, you know, I was in eighth grade. I didn't have to know them that much. It was, we were teaching, um, we were teaching elementary age students. They were like fourth grade. Yeah. So it was just very basic English, uh, about American traditions. Um, some basic, like they knew math. I forget what we taught numbers wise, but like, I think it was more so just like, it was a, mainly just like a, a lingual like speaking class. Okay. So we went over like some other subjects mm-hmm. and explained it in English. Gotcha. So like they would learn like math and English and like what numbers and all that. Um, I, I don't remember our full teaching curriculum and all that, but they also had like PE because it was basically a summer camp for them. So they also had PE. And they also had music time. Mm. And then at the very end, they also had a skit time. So we were like the English class Mm -hmm. for them. So they came to us and we taught English. Then they would go learn a skit. They would go play games and then they would go to um, music class. And as the assistant for my sister, I went with them to all of these. Um, So like I bounced around to play basketball with them at PE. The skit, I can't remember at all. It 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 was a pretty dumb skit, but I mean, what skits aren't dumb? It was just something so that they had to use English yeah. in conversation is basically what it forced them mm-hmm. to do. And then uh, the music song. And for the music, for some reason, every year they did You Raise Me Up. Mm-hmm. Uh, you Raise Me Up. Yeah. Every year they did that song. And every year, the people we went with, like the other teachers and stuff, were like, man, I hate teaching this song. I hate this song. I'm like, why? Like, it's just a normal, mm-hmm. normal song. Why do you hate it? They're like, well, they sing it at the end. And I'm like, okay. And they're like, and it just gets emotional. And I'm like, why? Well, what I didn't realize was the whole reason, I don't know why, that who chose this song and what the motivation behind it was to choose this song. Mm-hmm. But basically, throughout the week, the students understood the lyrics. Mm-hmm. And then you built a relationship with these kids. Mm-hmm. And they knew, and we knew, leaving, I'm not coming. Like, if I if you come back to China, you go, we went to Xi'an. 
the same kids didn't really ever come to the summer camp. Yeah. Because it was for like a specific age group. Uh Uh-huh. So then they're out of that age group very quickly. Yeah. So more than likely, you're never seeing these kids again. Mm -hmm. And they knew that too. More than Mm -hmm. likely, they're never seeing us again. And we would spend, we stayed on the premise. We stayed like technically half a mile away, but we're with them sun up to sundown almost pretty much every day for like three weeks. Mm Mm-hmm. You build, and so you, you build, build a good relationship yeah. with all these kids. Mm-hmm. I still remember mo- a lot of them. I still have some of their like QQ numbers, which is like the Chinese AIM. Okay. Um, I still had that like some of their QQ mean numbers anything to me. uh, and stuff like that. Um, it was right around the time that like uh, WeChat, I think, was getting big, but it wasn't okay. quite big yet. Um, so I still had like all their numbers and stuff like that. I haven't talked to any of them in a long time, but for years after I did, I stayed in touch with them. So like you, you built like super close yeah. relationships during that time. And then I finally understood because then you get to the final day and they, they get on stage, they do their skit, mm-hmm. they recite like because all the parents come to see like yeah. what they learn. And then when they sing You Raise Me Up, they had us. We were all sit, like, sitting in the front row and it was like they were like singing it to us uh-huh. in a certain way. And all the kids are bawling their eyes out singing <laughs> it. So all week leading up, it's just this That's fun. Tough, dude. It's this fun like. You know, it's a children's choir yeah. singing You Raise Me Up. Like, mm-hmm. it's just a fun, like, nothing weird about it, mm-hmm. normal thing. Then it turns into just a bunch of kids <laughs> bawling their eyes out, crying, can't get through the words, singing it. And so then every time you hear that song, I just immediately hear it <laughs> in that, in that like, That's these so kids tough. that I built a three-week relationship with that I know I'm never going to see They're again. They're leaving. I'm I'm leaving them. They're making eye contact with you while a lot crying. Because a lot of them, because there were some... Um, the, the school would hire like American teachers every year to like mm-hmm. help the the English part of that school. Yeah. So a lot of the kids would be like, can you please like come teach at the school? Oh my and gosh. you're like, no, like I'm an eighth grader. I have to go to high school next year. <laughs> my sister's like studying to be a doctor and like all this. And so we're like, no, like we, we're, we're not coming. We, we, we might be able to come back next summer. And like, well, whenever you're, cause like what was also cool was my sister had been going there. This was my sister's last trip. Mm-hmm. She'd been going there five or six years. And so like when she, when we got there, like two or three of the nights, she went and like visited past students. Okay. From like a camp that she went to like six years ago. Wow. But every year she went mm-hmm. and they would like, as soon as she was in, in Xi'an, she would message me like, hey, and they'd meet up, go to dinner, and then we'd go back to their house and like. That's cool. Whatever. So I was a part of all that, but this was the only students I built a relationship with. And so, yeah, whenever you hear you raise me up, I just immediately hear it <laughs> like a, a choir of like 30 Chinese. Sobbing Chinese kids. kids. Yeah. A, a, a choir of like 30. 12 year old Chinese kids, boys and girls singing it, just bawling their eyes out. And then afterwards they would all just run up and hug you because like, this was like, we went to that and then we got on a train, a train to Beijing. Mm-hmm. So like, it was literally like, it's not like, okay, we're still going to see you yeah. tomorrow. Like no, this, this was like the, the, the goodbye. Oh like my this gosh. was it. Oh man, it was tough. That's emotional. That was, was emotional. It was emotional, but I don't, I don't cry when I hear it. Um, Does your computer keep recording after it goes to sleep? It's not asleep. It's not okay. No, and Very it looks good. like it's recording. We're just a two-man band over here. We're a two-man today. band. Yeah. Um. So I mean, Connor, just another random. Thing yeah, that just came like off the top of your off head. off the top of my head. What's the, like the worst piece of advice you you've ever gotten? <laughs> <laughs> just off the top of my off the cuff here. Off the top of it, the worst piece of advice, I think that I and everybody's ever gotten is you do you. You do you, boo. I think that's fine on a very, very surface level basis. I think it's a situational I advice. think it'll get you in a lot of trouble. It will. But I do think like there are There's a lot things, of bad parts of you. But there's also a lot of like, that is also true in a lot of situations. <laughs> yes. Like you walk you're in a right. room and like you're, everyone's trying to make you do like conform to a certain thing. And you're mm-hmm. just like, you know what? You do you. No, like you, like be yourself is But a good. lot of times it is being but, used like- But like some like, people uh, are psychopaths and them being them is murdering people. Well, it's also, it also is a lot of times used in a negative way where it's like, mm, you like do you. you do something bad. And it's like, hey, you know what? You do you, you do boo. You. Yeah. Like, hey, you do you. It's I, just yeah, like, it's, it's like, I think it's not necessarily bad advice. But there can be bad situations for that advice. I think it's not just a generic advice for like every situation. Yeah, I'm trying to think of the worst. I'm gonna get flamed for that. No, I don't think so. I think so. Uh, the Everybody's worst. Gonna be like, what's wrong with being yourself? Well, no, being yourself. I think you be you isn't the same as like be yourself. Yeah, it's not. I don't it think, has a different I connotation. I think. I agree. Because uh, I think you do you is more like it's a lot more. At least when I've heard it said, it's a lot more said when you've already done something, and you're like trying to explain. You're like, hey, you know what? You do you. Mm-hmm. That's fine. Yeah, that's and it's just very like true. I don't want anything to do with what you're getting yourself into. You do you. I just always didn't really like that phrase that much. Um, m- but I, you do you, man. Yeah, uh, I don't know. To be completely honest with you, I think a lot of it. I don't think I've acted on bad advice 
to where like it's gotten me in trouble. Yeah. If that makes sense. I usually can recognize bad advice pretty easily. Yeah. Cause most like I, the most of the advice that I would say is like the worst pieces of advice have been financial and they've been like <laughs> from like, well, modern day from TikTok or Instagram or YouTube or whatever, or like from me reading and I'll like read something or hear something and it like, I, I immediately am like, that kind of goes against what I've learned from like a more trustworthy source. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And like, I guess part of it is I've always had older people I've looked up to yeah. that I trust, trusted a lot in pretty much every avenue of my life. Right. And so especially on the finance side, I've had like my father and my grandfather and my uncle who, if something doesn't make sense, I take it to them mm-hmm. and they have a really good perspective on it. And so a lot of the advice doesn't even make it to them because I yeah. hear it. I'm like, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Like, mm-mm, mm-mm. I, like one of, okay, here's one that's gotten popular recently that it, the essence of it is possible and could make you a lot of money, mm-hmm. but they don't, they tend to not tell you the drastic risk you're taking. Yeah. So basically how it's pitched, it, it's called uh, I think it's technically called like wholesaling houses. Okay. I think it's technically what it's called. But essentially how it's pitched is like you drive down a random street or whatever and you go door to door or you find these houses online. Well, let's just say you owned a house and I'm a, I'm a okay. wholesaler and I look at your house and I'm like, man, your house is kind of run down. But with some with some TLC and some like money invested, it could be something. Right. Mm-hmm. So I'm looking at it and I'm like, you know what? I think your house could sell for 250 is what I'm thinking in my head. I think that a, an investor could pour money into it, could sell it for two fifty, right? So that investor is going to be happy. Like I would, let's say in my head, it's going to take like 50, 60 grand to sell it for two fifty. Okay. So I know that investor, if he gets it for less than one ninety, if he gets it for like one sixty, he's going to be happy. Mm-hmm. So then I don't want to pour money into that house, right? But yeah, I walk up to your door and I'm like, hey, I'll give you one hundred twenty thousand dollars cash to buy mm-hmm. your house right now. Or you find these deals on online. A lot of them you see like the the sketchy signs that say we buy houses for cash yeah, like, on yeah, side yeah. of the roads. That's what these people are doing. Okay, okay. A lot of times. Um, and they're intentionally look sketchy, apparently. Oh, really? Apparently because they said that if they look too put together, it'll attract houses that they don't want to buy. Oh. So they make it look like less put together so that it gets less put together houses. Gotcha. Fascinating stuff. That is fascinating. Regardless. Regarding. Regardless. So I walk up to you. Regarding. Regardless. I walk up to you and I say, I'll buy your house 120 cash. And you're like, you know what? 130, you got a deal. Like I could really use that cash right now. 130 mm-hmm. cash for my house. Like I only paid a hundred for it. However many years ago, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So I'm like, I get your under contract, 130. Uh-huh. And in the contract, I have 30 days to give you the money. Boom. We signed the contract, right? I now have 30 days to find a buyer and sell it because I don't have $130,000 cash. <laughs> so then I go to a network of investors uh-huh. and I'm like, Hey, I have this great property downtown i really think you put you know 50 60 grand you can sell it for 250 i want 150 150 thousand dollars for it right now (laughs) and then because legally this is where it's a weird loophole legally most states when i have a house under contract it is now my property yeah you just have 30 days to get out of it even Mm -hmm. though i haven't paid you for it Mm -hmm. so basically in that 30 days i now have time that i find someone that pays me 150 for it yeah and then i write you the check for 130 and i do nothing and i get 20 grand Right. Sounds terrifying. It sounds terrifying. Well, cause yeah. it is because yeah. a lot of it is you can, you can be a very like scumbaggy person and have like contingencies to where like, it's all contingent on me finding a buyer mm-hmm. type thing to where like you're, you think you have a guaranteed one thirty. we yeah. get to 30 days. I don't, but a lot of times they don't go over all the potential risks. So a lot of times like where it's risky is, and this is the same with like writing options on stocks is when that 30 days hits, I owe you one hundred thirty thousand mm-hmm. dollars cash because I yeah. made a cash offer. Yeah. If I don't have one hundred thirty thousand dollars cash, what's gonna happen? You now have the right to come after me for that one hundred thirty thousand. Yeah. That That's you, why it's terrifying. Yeah. And it's a similar thing to uh, there's a lot of people that do options trading, mm-hmm. and options trading is again a very similar thing, where uh, there's like puts and calls, right? So a put okay. means it can be put to me, and a call means I'm gonna call it from you, okay. more or less. Very very basic. I don't know much about options trading. I avoid it. There's two types of calls. There's a covered call, which means if something gets called from me, it's covered. I actually What do you mean called from you? So, if you so basically what let's say I own 100 just name a random company. 
Verizon. Verizon. So let's say I own 200 shares of Verizon. Okay. Okay. If I write one call, basically what that means is you are buying this call at, let's say Verizon's at $40 a share. Okay. You are buying this call at $41 and it's 30 days, 60 days out. Mm -hmm. Okay. You're buying it at $41 and you're willing to pay me a dollar per share extra. Right. And so one call is a hundred shares. So let's just say it's a 30 day, 30 days out. You are hedging your bet that in 30 days, that stock is going to be worth more than $42. No matter what, let's say that stock runs up to $65 in 30 days. Since I wrote the call to you, you have the right to buy that stock from me, 100 shares of that stock from me for $41. Gotcha. No matter okay. what it is at, right? So a covered call is a pretty safe way because I own the shares. If it's something like I bought Verizon at $36, right? I sell you a call at $41 mm-hmm. and it's a dollar per share. You're going to pay me 100 bucks. And if it goes to $41, even if it runs up to 50, if it goes to $41, I'm making six bucks a share. Yeah. End of the day, I lost like I lost potential money, mm-hmm. but I made money. Yeah. And if it doesn't go, if it goes to if it's at thirty nine dollars at the end of that thirty days, I got a hundred bucks. Yeah. So you're basically paying me a hundred bucks because you think it's gonna go higher. Yeah. I'm taking that hundred bucks because I either think that's not true, or I don't care if it does. Mm-hmm. What people will do though, is if you don't have enough money or you don't want to own a hundred shares of a certain stock, they'll write uncovered calls. Okay. So basically, what that means is you exact same person, you want to buy a call, the right to buy it at $41. Yes. So you pay me $100 uh-huh. for the right to buy 100 shares at $41. Okay. I don't own 100 shares. I am saying there's no way it's going to $41. So you pay me 100 bucks. This is an uncovered call, right? Okay. You give me 100 bucks. You legally have the right to, t- to 100 shares. If it goes above $41, you can exercise that call. Okay. If it doesn't go above it, you're not going to exercise, you can't exercise the call. So now, end of the 30 days, the stock's at $45. You exercise the right to that call, right? Now, what do you do? I now have to buy the four, <laughs> I now have to buy 100 shares at $45 at, yeah, at and the sell it price. to you at 41 Dang. So, okay. it's bas- it's just, that is where it's, a hun- well, the stock market already is basically gambling to a certain extent. Mm-hmm. You can do a lot of research and try to make it not, but like, to a certain extent, yeah. you're gambling on the future of these companies. No one knows exactly what's This is actually gambling, because mm-hmm. basically... You, it's not gambling for you because you're saying it's someone is. You're saying, yeah, a hundred bucks. I think this is going above this, and I'm saying, deal, hundred bucks. It's not. Yeah. But the difference is like if I make a Blizzard bet and I have two Blizzards in my hand, and you're like, dude, five bucks says that Blizzard isn't thirty two degrees in ten minutes. I'm like, five bucks says it is. Mm -hmm. Like if it is, you owe me the Blizzard. I'm like, deal. Oh shoot, there's the Blizzard. Versus I have no Blizzard. You're like five bucks. It's not in ten minutes. I'm like, deal. And then you got. And then it is. I'm like, dang, I gotta go buy a blizzard. <laughs> and then I had to buy a blizzard and hand it to you. Yeah, that's kind of like wholesaling houses. Gotcha. Very risky investment. Sounds but very risky. A lot of people who have made a lot of money on social media are the like one percent that have been successful at those two things. Mm-hmm. And so they're really good at they they've they've had success writing uncovered options and doing options trading or wholesaling market or, or wholesaling houses. Mm-hmm. So when they tell you like, hey, look, you know Amazon's not going to five thousand dollars a share so but this person thinks it is so all you got to do is have him write a call at three dollars you'll make 300 bucks that week (laughs) they don't tell you that if amazon goes you're gonna owe five hundred thousand dollars if amazon goes there and this person's only gonna give you three hundred thousand for it so the two hundred thousand dollars you're just burning the money and most people don't have that money to burn yeah, that's what I was, like the, that's not a fair thing. The influencer people that do it probably have the money if it goes. Yeah, but like south. they're pitching it as like, hey, this is a great way to yeah. like start making a hundred thousand dollars a year right now. And it's like, I hate. Those could ads. you make a hundred thousand dollars a year right now off of that? Yes. Could you also be in debt a million dollars this year because of that? Yes. <laughs> probably more realistically, yes. I I'm think there's my. Computer. I think my least favorite ads on YouTube are the ones where uh, it's just like an, a guy recording with an iPhone and he's like, yo, 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 how much money were you making last month? And they, like the guy says, and he's like, okay, now show me your paycheck. And oh, then he shows like his paycheck and it's like, it's just And it's my just favorite so ones are those, he's like, he's only been doing my program for three weeks, man. Yeah, yeah. It's like, okay, gosh. gosh. <laughs> that's, a th- that's the thing is if you get financial advice on TikTok or Instagram or something, <laughs> 
step number one before you even consider is this valid is go to their go to their profile mm-hmm. and if they're selling a course 90 yeah. percent chance is not valid very true because 90 percent chance that they're just trying to sell you on a lifestyle that they don't even have yet because they and have, they're getting yeah. the lifestyle by you buying their courses mm-hmm. man very true all right just off the top of your head like what you got any other questions yeah man for What's sure off the top of my head let me let me see if i can think of one. Oh, you want to look at one uh, you want you want me to just keep? I'll just I'll just keep, keep, uh, keep refreshing yeah. your mind <laughs> until you uh, choose one. <laughs> I mean, whenever I mean, I okay, here we go. Okay. What is what is Hunter? Just yeah. like I've been thinking about it lately. And okay, I'm yeah. Wondering yeah. from you, what's like the most annoying habit someone can have? Absolutely. I've got one for you. I've been picking my nails this entire time. <laughs> that doesn't annoy me when people do that. All right, cool. It's because you can't hear it because you have headphones on. <laughs> no, no, even if I can hear it. Uh, most annoying. In school, it was like when someone bounced their foot, mm. but only if you could hear it. Okay. Like if you're just like the visual of it doesn't bother me. Like I'm yeah. bouncing my foot right now. You can't hear. But there are some people that like would be hitting the bottom of their desk and be like, mm-hmm. and like you're trying to take a test and it's just yeah. Like, in the background, oh, that got that that annoyed me. That I get that, but I mean, it's it was like a you didn't really want to say anything either because you know like that person's like stressing about the test yeah. and they're trying to focus yeah. and that's what they're naturally doing. So that I was like, a tough one. I I don't know, not no habits really annoy me, and I think it's because I am probably the one that annoys people because I am pretty much a walking bundle of everybody's least favorite habits. Like I'm I'm a walking bundle of everybody else's pet peeves. Because I don't know, I don't know how my wife lives with me. Because, like, I literally am, I am all of her pet peeves. <laughs> I don't know why she married me. <laughs> because I tap my foot constantly. If we're at the movie theater, I'm shaking the whole row because I'm moving my legs so much. I like, I pick and bite at my nails, which is like her number one thing that really? she gets annoyed about. Like, if we're sitting on the couch, she'll hear like one like little click of me like biting my nails, and she'll be like, "Stop it!" <laughs> and she'll be like, "You need to stop it." I was like, "I don't feel convicted about it." <laughs> <laughs> Um, and I hum a lot and I whistle a lot. I'm very uh, loud in public places. I'm, I'm, so I always growing up just like, if it's quiet, I just make noise. <laughs> like I hum, I sing, I do something just like, cause like it, sometimes I want it quiet to like think about something yeah, or yeah, like yeah. read a book or whatever. Mm-hmm. But like, if it's just quiet to be quiet, I'm not for that. <laughs> and Liz though, my wife cannot stand it. Cause like in my house, no one told me to stop. Yeah. Like I'd walk around yeah, singing. Same. No one cared. Yeah. Like my mom would like laugh at it. Yeah. Like she so I just walk around singing. <laughs> so we'll be at home and like a song will get in my head and I'll just start singing it. And Liz will be like, if you don't stop singing. <laughs> and I'm like, what why? Like I'm just I'm just singing. Like I'm just ha- I, I'm sorry my my overbounding joy annoys you. <laughs> I'm sorry my pure happiness over here in the kitchen while I'm making my peanut butter and jelly is irritating you. And she's like, I just like I'm just trying to watch TV. She's like, I don't want to hear you sing. I'm like, okay, fine. <laughs> uh, and same with like humming. But I don't, I have very few that annoy. I think one thing that like kind of gets under my skin, but it's more because it like removes my appetite uh-huh. is if we're in like a really quiet place and we're like, like, let's, like me and you are here <laughs> and we're not really talking. Like we're either not that close of friends or like whatever. Uh-huh. And so there's no noise and we're just eating next to each other. Uh, yeah. And yeah. it's just like loud chewing noises. Yeah. I'm kind of a loud. I'm kind of a loud it. eater, but it, it's only like it would have like to hear it. I have to be like this yeah. close to you. What was it that I was eating? I had like one thing for lunch like every day one week, and it was so loud. I, don't I know. can't remember what it was, but I feel like every day you would just look over and be like, "That is just the loudest thing I've ever heard." Yeah, but I mean oh. that's the. Uh, I can't remember what it was, but it was that funny. one only it only bothers me while I'm eating though, because mm. like if I hear someone else like. <laughs> And like swallow like while I'm trying because Trevor's a loud eater too. He is, yeah, yeah, yeah. So like if I'm eating lunch, I'll, so, I'll have to sometimes put my headphones on to make sure I can't hear because this office does like if everyone's eating and no one's talking, yeah, it it's does kind of echoing. It, it here. can get quiet and you can hear you can hear mouth noise. Back. Yeah, it's it's stressful. It's stressful as someone who is a loud eater. Anytime you're in a quiet situation and you're eating, I'm just like self conscious. I think the I'm whole a loud time. eater. I'm pretty I, sure I am. I think everybody is. Well, I suck on my food, not like intentionally. <laughs> I think you do too. I think that's what loud eaters do. What? Because my brother used to get on me. Because like basically when I eat, I like like the noise. The noise is like you sucking juices out no, of the food. No, it's like smacking. It's like when you open your mouth, everything's sticking. 
But it's like how you get your food to the back of your throat. I don't open my mouth when I eat you. I something's wrong with me, and I'm still loud whenever I keep my mouth closed while I eat. Yeah, but and to that I have to say no, I can't help it. So like, it's just my body. I think I am too. I think it's I think you suck when you eat. I need. I feel like I need to go, eat. Something. Go eat something. Because I that's what Jimmy used to get so mad at me because he was I guess it was a bigger pet peeve for him than me. Uh-huh. But like I would like suck while I'm eating, not paying attention, and like like do you ever did your tongue ever randomly pop like? While you're eating? No, my tongue when my jaw does. Oh, well, that's different. Well, like, you, you never make, like, noise? Yeah, yeah. While you're eating? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's from sucking. <laughs> like, try to make that noise without sucking in your mouth right now. I can't. You have to suck to suction the cup. Yeah. All right, I grabbed this off of Silas' desk. Who knows how Oh, that's a good one. Be. You're going to have to, yeah. Yeah, that, it's, a, it's a piece of caramel. Yeah. That is a, that's a good representation. I think loud go. chewers suck. <laughs> not, loud not, chewers suck. They don't suck as human beings. They just like I think t- in order to be a loud chewer, you have to be sucking. Like pay attention to what you're doing when you're just chewing. That noise right there, that's you <laughs> sucking. I can like it's literally it's literally. How do you same, not do that? I don't know. Like that's you su- I can hear you sucking. <laughs> that's literally I think it's just like that's that's how we eat. Like when we're born, we literally are sucking on My a My jaw also cracks every bite. Well, that's a different problem. How? Gosh. I haven't popped my jaw in a long time. Oh, wow. It's caramel. It's so caramely. But you feel yourself sucking now? <laughs> yeah. My teeth. I've got like caramel oh. implants in my teeth yeah. now. Well, there you go. All right. Let's get another topic or two, mm-hmm. huh? This is fun. What are some goals that you have failed to accomplish? Oh, that's no fun. This one's kind of deep, to be honest with you, mm-hmm. for me. Because... um. I ha- I had the realization like yesterday slash this morning that I haven't officially failed this goal yet, but I'm going to. Um, I set out at the beginning of the year, I wanted to, my number one goal was I wanted to run the 10 miler in September. Mm. That was my number one goal. I also wanted to run a half marathon later in the year. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I started training and by like April, May range, uh, I'd have to find the tweet, but I ran 10 miles and I, I, I successfully, I could go out and I could run 10 miles. I was in the best shape I've ever been in about that time. It's about that time. I, uh, I thought I had shin splints. Moral of the story. I didn't have shin splints. I thought I did, but at the time I thought I had shin splints and then my right mid shin inside mm-hmm. hurt every step. Yeah. It was after I did a 10K run, which is 6.2 miles. Yep. I did a 10K run. My shin splints were on fire about three miles in, but I'm three miles away from home at that point. So yep. I didn't have a choice. I ran home. Okay. So I just ran and gritted through it. Mm-hmm. And I got home. They never cold, calmed down. The next day, the next like week, every step I took hurt. Ouch. And so I was like, dang it. I overdid it. I now have a hairline fracture. Is what I was telling myself. I I've, I've fractured my shin. Mm-hmm. Because that's what, if you, if you stress, if you, push past it's a stress fracture if you push past like shin splints you keep going through you'll stress fracture yeah i don't so. understand what shin splints are Isn't i don't it when it, i think on, it's, it's whenever your muscle yeah it's whenever like your muscle separates from the bone yeah right? i think so something like that so that's what i was thinking this whole time and so i'm like all right well you know what i'm gonna take some time off and i'm gonna ride my bike and swim because that doesn't hurt shin splints it doesn't yeah. hurt me and so i'd ride my bike and like it would get tight but it didn't hurt and then when I swam, it would do a similar thing. Like it would kind of like feel weak, but it wouldn't hurt. Mm-hmm. I'm like, this is great. So I'm staying in shape. And Cause like my plan was to get to 10 mile shape and then just trim out my time as fast as I could. Yeah. So I wanted like by September to be like able to run a decent, an like, effective a, 10 su- a sub efficient. 10 minute mile. Okay. 10, 10 miler. That's pretty big. Cause I was at like 11 minutes yeah. and I was like, now that was in like April or May. So I'm mm-hmm. thinking the whole summer I'm just grinding on my time. Yeah. 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 I thought it was very doable. So I go like three weeks, every step still hurts. Mm-hmm. I didn't change anything else about what I was doing. I was biking, instead of running three days a week, I was biking three days a week and then I was swimming one or two days a week. So I was yeah. staying just as active because I was just making sure my cardio stayed up and every step still hurt and like playing disc golf hurt like crap. I'm like, what on earth? Like this sucks. This stress fracture just won't go away. So uh, my sister's a doctor and we went up, I forget why we were up there at my parents' house for a bonfire. And I explained to her, I was like, yeah, it sucks. Like, I just can't get my the stress fracture to go away. She's like, stress fracture? I was like, yeah, I had really bad shin splints. You mm. know, explain the whole story to her. She goes, interesting, Where where's the pain? I don't know why you didn't just, like, call her, like, immediately. I don't. I mean, when you have a doctor in your family, like, you don't want, 
only time you talk True. to her is like that makes sense i guess like i don't want to always bug her mm-hmm. like i'd rather just go to the doctor but i hate yeah. going to the doctor I mean, so the only time any of my family talks to me is whenever they want disc golf video advice yeah exactly <laughs> you know you, so you understand it yeah like it, it's very very no, like, annoying she's a doc she's at work all the time i don't when she comes home mm-hmm. she has to go back to that's work. that's totally what makes sense yeah yeah uh so i'm very i only ask her if it's like hey, do I need to go to the ER right now or am I fine? <laughs> uh, those are the only questions I asked my sister. But we were just talking about, because she asked me how my running was going, I was explaining to her. And she's like, where is it hurt? I was like, inside shin, like right above the ball of my ankle. Mm-hmm. She goes, is it feeling better? I'm like, yeah, I think I, I like it's starting to feel better. I was like, I, I didn't swim or run or bike this week. I was like, so I think it helped it a little bit. I was like, but if I if I push down, I can still feel it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was like, so I think I might just go one more week with no swimming or biking and might be back. And so she, she was like, well, can I try something real quick? I'm like, yeah. And so she grabbed just around that area and squeezed really hard. Mm -hmm. And she was like, well, just tell me this hurts and squeezed. And it was like the most pain I've ever been in my life. Like it hurt so bad. She didn't squeeze the bone. She squeezed Mm -hmm. right behind my bone. And it was like excruciating pain. It still kind of hurts when I do it. It was like excruciating pain. And so I yelled, obviously, because it felt like my foot was being cut off. And she just started bust up laughing at me. I'm like, what? She goes, you don't have shin splints. I was like, what do you mean? She's like, that's where it's always hurt. I'm like, yeah. She goes, you've never had shin splints. I was like, Heather, okay, cool. Like doctor thing. What are you talking about? Yeah. She's she's like, you just have a really bad high ankle sprain and you just have never let it heal. Like you just keep running through it. She's like, when did this start? I was like, like November. And she's like, it just hurt every run. I was like, well, if I warm up enough, like I don't really feel it. But most runs, yeah, I feel it. And I'm just thinking, oh, Mm -hmm. I'm like and shin splints shin splints yeah like when I started I started running because I was like overweight mm-hmm. and so I wanted to lose weight obviously not the best idea to run to lose weight you told me that is what it is but still if you're like somewhat unathletic or you're like it slightly helps overweight, get in shape either way yeah yeah it's, it's but healthy you you'll develop shin splints like it's a very yeah, common yeah. thing because a lot of pressure on your yeah legs. and so I just was like, yeah, I developed shin splints. Like I never even questioned, is this shin splints? But basically when I run, I over rotate to the inside and Mm. every time it's, uh, it just is like re tearing those ligaments. It's never letting them heal. And so basically I have just for months been running on a high ankle sprain and playing disc golf on a high ankle sprain and all Mm -hmm. that. And it just got progressively worse. And then I wore, uh, the idio shoes, idiosyncrasy, yeah, which great shoe but it doesn't have arc support, mm-hmm. and I didn't realize it needed arc support. All yeah. of my shoes I own have it, mm-hmm. just by nature, because like trail running shoes, stuff like that, a lot of them yeah. have good arc support. Uh, arch support. Um, but that's what I need personally, because it helps keep me from overpronating yeah. going in. The Idio doesn't. So like a normal person, no problem at all. I played, before I ran the 10K that day, I played around disc golf on them. Mm-hmm. I remember you talking and about how your hurt. shin splints were getting really bad. I was really like, bad. man, my shin splints are killing me. Yeah, I remember that. No, they weren't. It was my ankle. It your was my ankle, ankle sprain, you dummy. And then I went home and I ran 3.1 miles that day. Mm-hmm. Killed me. Rested. Was feeling okay. Ran the 10K two days later. This, was that the one where you ran and then you had to walk home? Yeah, that day. Mm-hmm. The, th- the 5K. But I was just like, my shin splints are out of control. Yeah. So then I ran 10K two days later, and that's the one that, like, I was like, I pushed it too far. I broke my yeah. I broke my leg, whatever. I stress fractured my right leg. And so my sister was like, no, like, you oh, for the high ankle sprain, like, swimming and stuff probably won't hurt it, but you're not, it's not going to let it heal because mm-hmm. it's still going to have, like, a lot of action and stuff. Yeah. So, like, you need to, like, rest, rest. Mm-hmm. So that's what I did. I was already, like, three weeks out of running yeah. at this point. That was, like, three weeks ago, three or four weeks ago. I'm just now getting to where like if I stretch and warm up, I can run. And so it has now been basically six weeks went by of me not running. Mm -hmm. So on Saturday, I got up, stretched, made sure I felt good, did some like warm up jogs back and forth, was feeling great. I was like, you know what? Here we go. As soon as I feel pain, I'm going to stop running. So I ran pain free, ran a 5K, 3.1 miles, which used to just be like, I'd breeze through, yeah. wouldn't even really feel that tired. Uh, and I ran it at my 10K pace. It's so like a 10-minute, mm-hmm. little under 10-minute pace, which was my previous 10K pace. So again, soup, I should have breezed through it. I shouldn't have even broke a sweat. Yeah. It was like I'd never ran before in my life. Mm. Like I came home, I was Dang. like gasping for air, drenched in sweat. My legs felt weak. And I, it hit me. I mean, I took six weeks off of running. Gosh. I'm basically back to not running. That's so tough. So like all that I built up and got to 10 miles, like, and that could hurts. I from now till September get in 10 mile shape from zero? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Problem is 
you can't over over stress that you're well ankle. that and a few weeks from now literally a few weeks at this point like six weeks i'm gonna have a kid true yeah and my whole idea was if i'm in half marathon shape when i have a kid mm-hmm. i'll just need to run like once a week for the two or three weeks that it's like brutal i'm not gonna want to like i'm just gonna have to force myself to run yeah. those two weeks and then i'll have a month of like training of like okay now i can actually find some time to go actually train yeah a month of training before the 10 miler Mm-hmm. But now I'd be starting from zero. Yeah. So those few weeks when Luke is here and it's like, I, I mean, I could go run for an hour, but we, we'd have a newborn and my yeah. wife probably isn't going to be in a, a state where she like running for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, yeah. like going and running two miles. That's one thing. Running for an hour when you have a newborn yeah, probably isn't going to be the best idea. And that's the runs I would have to be doing to get in a 10 mm-hmm. mile shape. So I realized this morning I got up at 5 a.m. with the intent to run and I stood up and I started stretching and then I like was thinking I was like well how far am I going to run like running three miles kind of killed me we have to film a video today I was like I could just run two and I was like I'm back at like two miles is what I was running like two years ago at this point Mm. basically like I'm I'm back to or a year and a half yeah was it a year ago we started running okay so two miles basically I was running a year ago Mm -hmm. at this point like I'm back, I'm back to where we started. Like we start, I started running May last year mm. and I'm, I think I'm in about the same shape as I was then. I was like, that hurts. So like same running shape, same running shape. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm in, I'm in much better physical overall shape. Mm-hmm. I've lost almost 20 pounds since then in the last year. Um, so, and I, my cardio is definitely better than mm-hmm. it was running. Cause like I would have to push myself to get through runs. I was still yeah. able to get through the 5K run at like a 9.30 pace, which is really bad 5K pace for me. Uh, but I was still able to get through it and survive, which a year ago, if I ran a 5K, I would have been like 11 minute pace. Mm-hmm. So I'm in better shape, but not as good shape as when I started training for the yeah. 10, 10 miler. So yeah, that was really, really disappointing because it like hit me this morning all at once. I was like, I'm not running the 10 miler this year. Like I there's... Is there a way? Yes, but I would have to like sacrifice a lot of things that aren't as important or is are more important to me than running a ten miler. Something tells me you're gonna end up running that. I would love to. <laughs> I really want to. You just don't like. I just I know you, and you're gonna end up doing it, even if you end up doing it and hurting yourself really badly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, I would I would really really love to say like at the end of September, be like, I f- can't believe I freaking did it. Mm-hmm. Like that would feel so good. Yeah. But this morning, I didn't run this morning. Hmm. Like, that's the hard part is I've never not been motivated to run. But this morning, like, the realization that I'm starting from zero was, like, a rude awakening of, mm. like, I'm literally starting over. Like, yeah. I like I had a full, like, 13-week to half marathon training plan that I was going through. And I was on week, like, 12 when I got hurt. And I'm, like, I would literally, like, I don't know if I'm in good enough shape to start it over right now. Mm. Like, it's 5K to, to half marathon. Yeah. And I'm, like if I started like five days a week running, I was like, if I started it over right now, it would put me almost at the 10 K the 10 miler. And I don't know, like I'm not going to have time in the middle, the middle of that to be doing the, cause where I'd gotten, you did like a speed run, uh, like casual, you did like two casual runs, two speed runs and one distance run a week, a long run, a long run. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so I made sure I got one recovery run and one speed run in a week. And then my long run every Saturday. Mm-hmm. I made sure I got those. If the other two I could get, I could. But most of the time, I, I got it Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. Okay. But I was to the point where my speed runs were like seven miles. Mm. And like by speed, they would basically make you run like 5K pace for like a mile and a half. And then like recovery run pace. And then you go. And so they would take me, you know, 70 minutes, 80 minutes. Like they were a big commitment. Yeah. And like that's about where I would be when I had like a two week old. Mm. I'm like, I don't, I don't think I can do that. Yeah. So like, it's really like, I I don't know how I'm going to get the motive. Like that's why I didn't have motivation to run this morning. And I was like, I was always running for a goal. I was never just running to run. Yeah. So like this morning would have been me just running to run. And I was like, I don't think I want to. Mm. But like, that is tough because it's not even like I'm giving up like, oh man, but you trained so hard to get here. Like I've already lost it all. Mm -hmm. Cause like that was motivation before too. It was like, well, Hunter, look. You, at least trained, maintain you've trained so hard to get to where you can run 10 miles like at least at least like stay where you can run like if you go out and you want to run 6.2 miles 7 miles whatever you can yeah i've already lost all that now dang so we'll see that i sucks. mean if september comes and i run the 10 miler 
I'm going to feel like a freaking superhuman. It is definitely a lot easier to do any of that with a goal. Yeah. Because well, the, we, other, the other thing that freaking hurt, hurt my goal was in the midst of me getting like really into the training, mm-hmm. Trevor had Brooks in January. Yeah. That's about when I started training. Mm-hmm. And Trevor in January was like, as soon as like, as soon as Kenzie can like, cause she had a C-section. So the recovery process was a lot longer. It's yeah. like, as soon as she can watch Brooks on her own, I'm going back to the gym, running again, mm-hmm. all this stuff. About that time I was like, look, I'm not interested in going to the gym. Yeah. Like I just want to run. Mm-hmm. So this is when I really got into it thinking Trevor and I are running the 10 miler yeah. in September together. And so it was a big thing of like, I'm not letting Trevor down. Mm-hmm. Like Trevor's going to be at the, septa- the starting line. I'm yeah. going to be there. Well then like, it was like a month long process before he started like could run again. And then he was like, I think I'm going to start going to the gym first. Like then I'll get into running. Mm. And then he was like, you know, I don't, I don't know. Like he never really started going to the gym. He never really got back into running. Mm-hmm. And then once he, now he is back into running, running every day. And so I brought something up to him like two days ago. I'm like, yeah, dude, I just don't know. Like the 10, this is, this is before he left. I was saying something. I was like the 10 miler. Like I can tell you, he's like, yeah, he's like, I don't think I'm interested in long runs. He's like, I, I think I just want to run short runs as fast as I can, which is the opposite <laughs> of what I want to do. Like running a, it's like the most Trevor thing I've ever heard. Running a 15 minute 5k, like doesn't, doesn't excite me because like, mm-hmm. I don't, I don't like sprinting. Yeah. Like what was nice about like going on a two hour, hour and a half run. Cause like 10 miles, 11 minute pace was like a 110 minutes. It was mm-hmm. almost two hour run. What was nice about that was like, it was just you for an hour and 10 minutes. Mm-hmm. Like, and you're running at a slow pace. Cause what was weird was when I would get done with the 10 mile run, I wasn't like gasping for air or tired or anything. You just got through your threshold mm-hmm. and then you just like, like you were breathing somewhat hard, but your mm-hmm. breathing was consistent. Your legs felt good. You were tired when you were done. Yeah. But it wasn't like you got back. Like if you go and sprint a mile and try to run like a under seven minute mile or under six minute mile. Yeah. You you're get exhausted. back and you're yeah. dead. You're like, <laughs> you never got to that. Mm-hmm. So it was very easy to just run, think. I could have carried a conversation on pretty much the whole time. Like, that was great. Yeah. I loved running like that. I don't love running fast. Mm-hmm. And that's what Trevor's like. I just want to run fast. Mm. And so then I was like, well, Trevor's not even going to be at the 10 mile. <laughs> so like, this is literally at this point, it's just for me. Mm. Like, it's just if I do it or not. And I'll be there, man. I don't think I'm going to do it, man. <laughs> I don't think so. I, you know, at this point, like, I hope I run the turkey trot the 5k on Thanksgiving. I hope I do that. But knowing myself, if I don't start running within the next few days and like mm-hmm. getting back into running, I'm not running the rest of the year. Mm. Like I'll just, when I lose a habit or lose a goal like that, it just defeats me. I yeah. just like, I'm not, I don't even want to touch the subject. I anymore. get that. I get that for sure. What about you, man? What's some goals you failed to accomplish now that I <laughs> ran for 30 minutes? Well, uh, I told you about this on Monday that I had made a goal. I got felt very motivated on Sunday and I was like, that's it. Every day this week I'm waking up uh, in order to cut, like we work at seven. So I usually get up at six 30 and just like brush my teeth, put on clothes. Cause I take a shower before bed. Uh, so I just like wake up at six 30, brush my teeth, put on clothes, grab my wallet and go straight outside in my car and drive here. Like, yeah. and I've never been a person that has like a routine before going anywhere. Like I, my routine is waking up and going there immediately. Like that's always just been how I've been. And the problem with me is if I've got something going on at 11, that means I'm not anymore. Now I wake up at seven, no matter what day it is. But like when I was in college, if I don't have anything till 11, I'm waking up at 10 30 and I'm getting ready and then I'm going like there was no, I didn't have a morning. Yeah. And I like now that now I, I'm at work at seven every day. I love that because we have so much day left whenever we get off. We've got so much time to do anything and so much sunlight, which is great. Um, time, a lot of time to spend with family, which is cool. But uh, my problem is I still feel like I need to have a routine before work. I've always felt like convicted about that, that I think that it's very healthy to have a morning routine that doesn't just mean crap I'm late let me run as fast as I can and put some shorts on yeah and and so I decided that on Monday I was gonna wake up at five um so that I could work out and then read for a little bit and then take a shower and get ready for work and everything and I set my alarm hey it's news every time and then I woke up feeling like the most defeated person in the world I woke up earlier like I got out of bed earlier than I normally would and I got to work 10 minutes early, which I never do. And, but I still just felt like a loser because it still was like, I didn't do what I meant to do. And then Tuesday came yesterday and I 
kind of was like whatever like i'll just set the alarm like it's whatever and then i like knew i was gonna like i like i set two alarms one for five o'clock and then one for 6 30 as soon as the five o'clock one went off i just turned it off You're like, ah, I get yeah up and then last night i only set one, one alarm and it was for 6 30 and because i just like gave up and just didn't even care to try today and so i feel like a failure <laughs> dang man so that's me <laughs> just a little bit about myself so i think what we're getting here is because we used to actually do this in uh, high school. We had like an accountability group mm-hmm. and we were supposed to like get up and read at 630 in the morning. Mm-hmm. And so what we did was we had a group chat. Yeah. And at 630 in the morning, you sent I'm up into the group chat. And so then if you slept until seven, you'd wake up and you'd see all your friends sent I'm yeah. up. Yeah. Could you cheat the system and fall back right? Yeah. Absolutely. Did mm-hmm. I do that a lot of morning? Absolutely. We would definitely catch each other though. But it was the it was the principle of it. Mm-hmm. So basically I went I need to get up early to run. Because uh-huh. I need to run before work. Yeah. You need to get up early to have a morning. Yeah. So I think five AM we just text each other. You just text me and then if I like and whoever's up, you just text because the other person has to text back. It's like, dang. All right. Cause then it's like because that's the whole thing. Is I, the whole reason I started running is I wanted to keep up with Trevor. Mm-hmm. And I didn't want to let Trevor down. <coughs> yeah. That's then why I need to, something like that. Then it got to a point where Trevor wasn't running anymore. And I was like, why am I still running? And it was like, <laughs> this is just for me at this point. Yeah. But I, I was still very motivated because mm-hmm. I had built the habit of running mm-hmm. for well, well, you were a good year at straight. It. I it's ran fun to do like things you're good straight. at. And you yeah. were good at it at that point. But when we first started, we were running like a mile here, a mile there. And yeah. it was literally just because Trevor was going to walk in and be like, you didn't run your mile this, like today or this yeah. week? And I bet, or I would walk in and be like, dude, Trevor, I saw you on the app. You didn't run your mile this week. Mm-hmm. What happened? Mm-hmm. That's tomorrow it. morning, I'm texting you 5 a.m. All right. Well, it's not going to work tomorrow morning because I'm going out of town. I'm texting you at 5 a.m. tomorrow morning. Okay, fine. You man. don't have to respond. That's it. I'm getting up at 5 a.m. Why would you not get up at 5 because you're going out of town? Touche. <laughs> Excuses. You're right. Do yeah. better. Saturday morning, I'm texting you 5 a.m. Uh, I was thinking more like five days a week. All right. All right, fine. All right, I'll see you at 5 a.m. Yeah, I'll see you at 5 see, I'll see your text at 5 a.m. Silas, this one's for you. Silas. Boots and cats and boots and cats and boots and cats and Silas.